Good morning and welcome to our third um, webinar with our wildlife officers this month. Um, I'm Alyssa Yapel. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Ohio's green gold or what you may know as ginseng. So I just want to point everybody out to the Q&A box. If you're joining us live today, please utilize the Q&A box and ask us any questions that you have about the uh, presentation. So I just want to quickly introduce who we have um, with us and uh, Lindsay Rist. She is a wildlife communications specialist with the Division of Wildlife. She's going to be helping me um, with answering your questions. So hello, Lindsay, and thanks for joining us. Um, next, we have Melissa, and Melissa has been a researcher with ODNR for a number of years. She's going to be your first presenter. Um, I'm having trouble sending Melissa live. There she is. Hi, Melissa. Um, Hi. And then after you hear from Melissa, we're going to go to Ron. He's a law enforcement program administrator, and um, he's also been the state coordinator for ginseng. For a number of years. And then lastly, we have Jay Obley. He's the District 4 Law Supervisor. Um, sending Jay live now. Just so you know who we're who's behind the screen today. Um, we will be talking to you uh, throughout this webinar. So Melissa is going to start it off for us. Um, so I'm going to send her live if I can. Let's see. There you are, Melissa. And um, I'm putting Melissa's PowerPoint up now and we can get started. OK, all right, thanks, Alyssa. Um, so, you know, as a researcher for ODNR, you might wonder what that is, but I actually got to go out and look at plants um, all around Ohio and I primarily looked at the really rare things, you know, the state endangered species or the federally endangered species. So I really hadn't looked at ginseng very much. Um, over at Division of Wildlife, they had this need to learn a little bit more about this ginseng plant here in Ohio. So um, I went out there and started looking for ginseng and was um, really amazed at how much ginseng we actually have in Ohio. I think there's a lot of people surprised to find out that we do have ginseng here in the state. And as a matter of fact, it's actually spread throughout the state. Um, really, wherever you can find good habitat for gin, for for ginseng, you you could find ginseng there. So there's a lot of variables. It's kind of a finicky plant, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. I kind of want to, um, I guess, get you started and, and teach you a little bit about what ginseng is. So in this photo right here, you're seeing the root itself. Um, so not not really too exciting. The plant itself really doesn't look all that exciting, but. It's the root itself that, that is very valuable. That's what people are out there looking for. Um, and you'll find that the plant is, um, it's one of those things that's actually what you would call hidden in plain sight. Let's see if I can get the slide to work. There we go. Um, so this is uh, the, the big exciting American ginseng plant. It's actually called Panax quinquefolius. So the plant that you see in the picture here is actually a mature plant. If you look close, you'll see it's a four prong plant. So that term prong is something that in the ginseng world actually refers to the number of leaves that the plant has. So it's uh, it's actually considered mature when it has three leaves or three prongs. Uh, if you look real close at this photo, you're going to see that you have a, one main stem coming up from the ground and then you have a whirl of leaves coming off that stem. There's also um, uh, on this plant, you can see where the, the little stalk where the flowers were. Um, that's where the seeds are going to be as well. So let's take a little closer look here. Panax, um, which is the genus name for this, it actually means cure all. So this plant is, has medicinal qualities. Um, people are, um, you know, they like to take this plant uh, pretty much as a remedy for anything, kind of like chicken soup for when you have a cold. Um, that's that's what ginseng is seen for. So the quinquefolius that refers to the five leaves um, that mature plants typically grow. Um, in reality, if you look at the leaf itself, it's a compound leaf. So it has five little leaflets on it. 
uh, when it's mature. Um, so the plants shown here, the one on the left is a four prong or four leaf plant. The one on the right is a three prong plant. Both of these are um, mature plants that are of the age where you could actually harvest them in Ohio. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So the picture on the left here is looking underneath the plant so you can see that that main stem really well. Um, just important to point out this is not a woody plant. Uh, so some of the lookalikes might have a woody stem, whereas this is not. This is an herbaceous plant. It's got that main stem. It's got the whirl of leaves off that main stem. Um, you can also see the flowering stalk right there in the middle. And then on the right, um, you know, I actually was having trouble I, in all the photos I've taken. I, I really didn't take very many pictures of the flower itself. Um, so there's a close up of what that uh, of the flower buds there on the right and then of some of them opening up. It's not a very showy flower. Um, it just has uh, little white leaves um, or white uh, petals on it and uh, it attracts some very generalist pollinators. Um, it can also self pollinate itself. The real big show are the seeds or the berries. Um, so this right here is a mature uh, four prong plant with um, it's actually loaded with berries, so um, you can see how they, they all actually turn color at different times. Um, you might have, uh, you know, the, the green, pinks, uh, different shades of red in there at any given time. Towards the end of the season, you could have this, you know, big bright ball of red berries. Here's a close up of them. So inside these berries, you might have one to three seeds. Um, and you know, it's very pulpy around the outside of it, so those seeds are going to drop. The the pulp around the, the seed actually kind of uh, goes away, and those seeds are going to sit in the soil um, and, and before they germinate. So one of the things that I found interesting about ginseng when I really, you know, started getting to know the plant and, um, you know, going out there and, and seeing it when it was going to seed. Um, so again, so it does flower in June and July and it doesn't go to seed until August or September. So that's the same time that our native spice bush is going to fruit. So you can see if you take a look at the, the fruit there of the spice bush, it looks very similar to the ginseng. And here's a picture of what a spice bush uh, actually looks like. So you can see it's, it's definitely taller than ginseng that grows maybe up to uh, 20 inches. I've seen some 24 inches tall, um, but that ginseng is gonna gonna hide out underneath the spice bush. And when you have those red spice bush berries, in addition to the ginseng berries, they all kind of camouflage um, uh, the ginseng, and and I think it's it, it helps it to hide more in plain sight as well. So something you can look for. Um, it can be a, a bit tricky when you see those spice bush uh, standing out, um, but the ginseng are at the same time. So we also have some other lookalike plants. Um, so at the top, you can see some of these uh, additional photos of ginseng. You see the five leaflets in that compound leaf there. Now, if you look at the plants below, Virginia creeper is one of those that I know when I first started looking for ginseng, um, that Virginia creeper kept catching my eye. Um, very similar plant, but if you look really close, you're gonna see that it has a woody stem. Uh, you know, grows kind of on the forest floor, very similar to ginseng, um, and, and it has um, very similar but different uh, leaflets there. If you look real close, you'll see the serration on the ginseng leaflets are a little different than that that's on the Virginia creeper. Another plant that's confusing, uh, confusing for many because it shares the same, a similar common name is that dwarf ginseng. So that's on the bottom right, and that is also known as ground nut. Um, so it it grows in different uh, different habitats than ginseng. So ginseng likes a nice, um, real rich soils. The the dwarf ginseng grows in a little more acidic, uh, moist, uh, kind of wetter soils, I guess, than than the uh, American ginseng. It also has a yellowish green fruit. Uh, and uh, grows real close to the ground. It's maybe eight inches tall um, at its tallest. So similar but different. 
So, you know, what's the root look like? I showed you that first slide. You got a little glimpse of what the root looks like. Um, here you can see one that is uh, freshly dug. Uh, it's got a lot of dirt around it there. You can see all those little, um, uh, all the pieces of the root that, that reach out to, to gather water. So uh, the root's going to be, it's going to look different depending on where it's growing. So whether it has to reach a little farther for water, whether it has everything it needs, um, it, it definitely affects the shape of the root. Um, so on the bottom right is some ginseng that was brought in. That's actually a 100 pound barrel of dried ginseng. The dried root looks a lot different than the um, wet root. They actually dry. It's about a three to one ratio, so it's going to shrink down a little bit um, to about a third of the size of when it was first uh, dug. And then again, that, that original picture you saw there showing some of those dried roots. So the more intact that root is, the more valuable it is. A little bit more about the life history. Um, so it's a very slow growing perennial plant. Uh, it grows on the forest floor. It likes those mature hardwoods, uh, like a beech maple type forest. It likes those rich soils. It likes shade. Uh, you know, some of the tallest plants I saw, though, uh, were getting kind of a mottled sunlight. So they'd have the sun for part of the day, and if they were in really rich soil, they grew really tall. Uh, they can actually grow really long as well. So, you know, 20 to even 75 years, which is a, you know, long time for a plant. Uh, most plants um, aren't really, uh, I guess the root kind of deteriorates uh, most likely the, the older it gets. So most plants would be harvested before they're 20 years old. So as it grows, it grows more leaves. I've seen a five prong plant a couple times. I've heard of a six prong plant, but I've never seen it. So, uh, you know, they should be out there somewhere. And of course, this this one is prized in Asia for medicinal use. So we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. But here's the, uh, the life cycle uh, of this plant. So you get those seeds in the ground and it takes about 18 to 20 months for that plant to actually germinate. And then you're gonna get uh, just a little uh, three leaflet um, seedling popping up. It kind of looks like a wild strawberry plant when it first pops up. And you'll see there's a couple pictures of those little seedlings. And as it grows, it's gonna grow more prongs, more leaf, leaves. There's uh, a photo of in the bottom right there, you've got a two prong plant as well as underneath of it, another seedling. So it takes about actually five to 10 years for this plant to grow and mature to where it's a harvestable size. So the plant in the bottom left, um, that's a three prong plant. So that, that's at least five to 10 years old. And then of course you get, uh, get it, uh, those big clusters of the red berries once you have those mature plants and you start the cycle all over again. So those plants going into the ground uh, this fall are not gonna germinate this coming spring. It's gonna wait until the following spring before it actually germinates. So it takes, takes it a long time. So here's a photo of some good uh, ginseng habitat. You know, I mentioned uh, beech maple type woods. Um, you could have the plant growing there. Uh, here's some photos of some plants. Um, you know, there's actually ginseng plants in these photos. You just have to look really, really hard. So, you know, when I mentioned uh, that it's it's kind of hard to find, it's hidden in plain sight. Uh, that's a pretty common term. Uh, you, you can see why. So there's a lot of green there and you have to be able to pick out those ginseng plants out of there. So believe it or not, somebody that um, like once you get a good eye for it, I mean, you can pick out ginseng from 30 feet away or even more depending on the time of year. So this plant is, is relatively common. It can grow in a lot of places. It's limited, um, you know, it can't go out in the West, any further in the West because it doesn't have the right soils to grow in. And you don't see it in Florida because it, it doesn't have the cold winters. It needs that cold winter weather to um, germinate that seed and to, to, to actually um, produce a, a good plant. So you can see that you know, it can be found just about anywhere, wherever you have those nice, um, those woods and the good habitat. Now, everybody I'm sure has seen, uh, you know, ginseng tea. Uh, you can see all these different products on the screen here that 
have some sort of ginseng in it. It's very popular. It's, I mean, it's even in shampoos, you know, going back to that um, idea that it's a cure-all. I mean, it really boosts your, um, makes your hair grow nicer. It helps you to feel better. It's a stimulant, uh, all kinds of reasons to consume ginseng. But one really good thing, important thing to note is that the ginseng being used in these types of products is not an American ginseng. Uh, this is a different type of ginseng. This would be um, like Korean ginseng. It's called Panax ginseng. And uh, that's that's actually a different species of ginseng, but it's uh, lower, it's considered a lower quality uh, of ginseng that, that's used in these. So that American ginseng that, that we're harvesting here in Ohio and, and in the US is being shipped off to, to Asia, but it's being used um, it's it's really highly prized. Uh, people are uh, consuming it directly themselves. You know, they're actually eating that root or making tea from the roots itself, or they might be hanging those really cool roots up on the wall for various reasons. Um, they're not they're not breaking it down and putting it into products like this. Some of the really cool things that ginseng can do, at least. Um, you know, you can find articles telling you that um, it's going to help you look long, younger. It's going to, um, it can lower your cholesterol, lower your blood sugar. It helps you, uh, helps stimulate your brain. It can ward off things like Alzheimer's disease, um, other things, uh, other signs of aging. It, it, it really is all, you know, this, this wondrous, plant um, wondrous root. It's even an aphrodisiac, so people might give it as as gifts for weddings um, to, to increase uh, reproduction. Uh, the more manly looking the root is, the better. And I had actually picked up this. Um, this handout came from a, a local um, a local herbal um, retailer. And they were saying, you know, you have your have three cups of ginseng tea a day, replace your coffee with ginseng. And, and these are some of the reasons why, you know, coffee can make you jittery. Coffee can irritate your kidneys, cause heart disease, high blood pressure, all of those things. Whereas ginseng is that anti-stress, um, clears your mind, makes you healthier, um, you know, all of those um, great benefits. It's the root of life. So um, you can even find it around, um, you know, in local herbal shops. Um, you can buy it on the counter there and, and you can find more information about it there. Uh, so I think that I'll go ahead and uh, pass it along to you, Ron, to talk a little bit more about ginseng uh, in Ohio and the, the regulations. <laughs> Yeah. Unless, unless you wanted to, um, I don't know if there's any questions that came in, Alyssa. Um, there was a question, but I think we're going to save it until the, uh, until Ron talks about cultivating ginseng, because um, okay. it might make more sense after that. Okay. Yep. Ron, do we have you? Um. Sorry guys, looks like. How about now? Oh, there you oh, go. There we are. Yeah. Took a second. Oh. All right. Do you have my uh, presentation? Yep, it's going live now. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Melissa. And you know, one of the the things that uh, I always think about with ginseng is, you know, the level of protection that it has. You know, this is not just um, protected under state law, but it's also protected under federal law. And you know, why is that? And it's a lot of the things that Melissa just talked to us about. Um, you know, it's a slow growing herb. It takes seven to 10 years to gain maturity where it's gonna actually recruit uh, young plants into the population. Uh, it actually has you know, a very low seeding rate until it gets you know, to be an older plant. Um, has a limited range here in the US. Uh, and then it is highly sought after. It's 
you know, there's folks out there looking for it. It, it is, does have value to it. It's worth a lot of money, uh, especially when, when the market is prime. So we do have a lot of people out there looking for it. Because of those factors, that's why it has this level of protection. Uh, and I think it's important that we talk about CITES, or the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, uh, when we talk about ginseng, just to give everyone, give everyone an idea of, of uh, you know, the level of protection and the hoops that I guess have to be jumped through in order for us to, to export it from the state of Ohio. Um, CITES, as I mentioned, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species has 183 member nations. So just about everybody in the world is a member of CITES and we're all looking out for each other's um, threatened and endangered species. Uh, CITES was created in July of 1975 and actually, uh, jump my slides here ahead. Uh, it was meant to protect you know, a whole host of critters. Um, the idea of, of uh, CITES is to ensure that international trade uh, in species of wild animals and plants uh, do not threaten the survival of species in the wild. Um, and it's important to mention there are 35,000 plants and animals worldwide that fall into one of three appendices. And the appendices are varying levels of protection. Now, the, the you know, appendix ones are really easy. Everybody knows appendix one. You know, our, our rhinos, uh, uh, elephants, you know, these are things that, that uh, you know, that there's, there's a only scientific collection or very special uh, needs need to be shown in order for them to be taken or moved internationally. There, there is little or no trade in these species permitted except for zoos and uh, zoological purposes, scientific reasons, things like that. Then we jump to appendix two. Here you can see we have a ginseng plant. Ginseng, ac ginseng actually falls into appendix two, uh, along with critters like the bobcat, which is in another Ohio species. Uh, these are things that their populations are doing well, um, but we, we want to make sure we have regulations in place because over harvest can negatively impact their populations. Um, yeah, Ron, it didn't advance to appendix two for me, um, okay. but you're, I don't know if you can maybe try and back. Go, yeah, uh, yeah, there. okay, there we go. There it is, okay, yep. there we go. So I'll leave it there for just a second. You know, other things on appendix two might be lookalikes. So oftentimes the lynx, uh, Canadian lynx uh, is, has a lot of, has high level of protection and the bobcat and the lynx they look very much so alike. So uh, in some ways or reasons, the bobcat is on, on the list as well to help protect a lookalike species. Uh, the next level is Appendix 3, and I'll just touch on it real quick. These can be relatively common species, but there are concerns about their international trade. There might be a lot of interest in them. Turtles are something that's been really common here in recent years, snapping turtles in particular, uh, which is what we have a picture of. Uh, if, you can, if you can see it in the shade there or not. But, uh, you know, there's a fair level of record keeping that takes place when anything's going to be traded internationally, shipped overseas. There's record keeping. We track the origin, the volumes of exports. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they, they keep that information for us. And um, if we think a population is becoming imperiled because of exports, then we can start lock, talk about moving it up the you know appendix two or maybe appendix one if it's something very drastic. So uh, those are the three appendixes just to give you an idea of what CITES is all about. I think it's important to do that. Now kind of move on to the, I guess, the role of the Division of Wildlife or the states uh, and when it comes to ginseng management. Here in Ohio, um, we took over the Division of Wildlife. We took over ginseng management in 1999. So it's been you know, 21 years ago, basically, that it came to the Division of Wildlife. It was within ODNR prior to that, so from 1975 until we took it over in 1999. It was with the uh, Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. Um, the transfer at the time was largely due to enforcement. Uh, we, the Division of Wildlife, wildlife officers statewide, the ginseng, you know, most of the population is on private property, even though you know it is on public land as well. But uh, natural area preserve officers were limited in numbers and they did not have authority to enter private property. Uh, 
and do enforcement as needed uh, when it came to landowner complaints. Uh, so the Division of Wildlife is already doing a lot of that heavy lifting and doing that work. So it was transferred over to the division in 1999. Um, for the Division of Wildlife and for all the states that have ginseng management programs, there are 19 states in the US and a handful of Native American tribes that have ginseng management programs. So a ginseng management program means that um, you have processes in place, and I'll talk about those in a minute, um, that are approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so that people can export ginseng from the state of Ohio. Uh, if a state does not have a ginseng management program, such as Michigan does not, uh, people cannot collect, you know, harvest, dig, um, ginseng and remove it from the state. It can only be used for, for local use. So that, that's very important for, uh, especially in Ohio, a certain segment of the population. Uh, ginseng is an important income to them. But back to states with ginseng management programs, of course, they establish and enforce harvest regulations like we have here in Ohio, uh, use sound science uh, to manage ginseng populations. The work that Melissa did was very important for us and, and kind of getting us a baseline of what's been going on with our population. Years ago, Jennifer Windus did important work here in Ohio. Jennifer worked for Natural Areas and Preserves at the time and was able to show that we needed to move our harvest date because our berries were not ripe when the season opened. So her important science uh, was important for a lot of states around us to move our season back. Uh, we train enforcement officers, not just our own, but uh, sheriff's deputies, state troopers, you know, anyone who, who asks, we train uh, law enforcement on ginseng laws here in the state. Uh, we, of course, want to pro you know, promote proper harvest, make sure folks are doing it right, doing it during the season. Um, and then, of course, certifying ginseng for export, which Jay and I will both talk a little about certifying ginseng, but uh, just the process of um, determining it was legally harvested, accounting for it, and allowing its export from the state of Ohio. So Ohio's ginseng management program, uh, this is actually right in law. Our goal is to achieve and maintain a sustained yield of ginseng so that harvesting of the plant is not detrimental to survival of the species. So that, that's the whole goal, kind of the same as CITES at the higher level, is to allow some use, but to make sure that we're not detrimental uh, to the long-term survival of the species, whether it's a wild animal or a plant. Um, for me, as the ginseng coordinator here in the state, uh, I have a number of duties within that. One of the important ones is to compile our certification, our law enforcement monitoring data, uh, all those things. I compile that annually and send that off to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where the um, Office of Scientific Authority and Office of Management Authority, they review that information, use it for their overall science, and to determine if, uh, if there is a detriment uh, to populations here in the state. And if they determine that there's no detriment, Detriment, they'll allow harvest to continue and export to continue. Um, another one is maintaining the certification program. Uh, certification, as I mentioned, is that process of basically, you know, people harvest ginseng, they sell it to a dealer, and then those dealers to export it from the state have to account for it. So making sure it was legally harvested, that there's paperwork that goes with that, that it's properly accounted for, the weights match, and then we provide a certificate for them to export that ginseng. And it is a process. It's uh, We establish the protocols, work with our investigators and sometimes our field officers on, uh, on certifying ginseng for the dealers. Uh, another part of it is making sure, ensuring that monitoring has happened. So uh, Melissa did that for for about nine years for us. So we're probably gonna go a little while here without having any study, but uh, here in the near future, we'll wanna start looking at who's gonna pick up her research and continue to monitor for us, uh, just to track the effects of harvest over time. And harvest can be legal and illegal. So we have these test plots, as you can see there on the map, they're spread all over the state and these test plots get monitored and, and we wanna make sure that uh, you know, we know what's going on with those populations. And sometimes there's legal harvest and we have encountered illegal harvest in some of these plots as well. A couple of the last ones, of course, are providing in-service training, not only for our officers, but the natural resource officers, uh, other law enforcement agencies so that they can help us out in this mission. Um, ensuring issuance of dealer permits. So we, we have, I think this year is about 45 dealers here in the state of Ohio. 
And then of course, uh, promoting sound wildlife or wild ginseng management uh, with our other natural resource partners, whether that's um, natural areas preserves, our state parks, our uh, local park districts, you know, county park districts. Uh, and then of course we work uh, with other law enforcement agencies, uh, our neighboring states, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agents on enforcement projects and, and just making sure that we're doing our best to uh, um, properly enforce the laws here in Ohio. And, and the last thing I really want to touch on is everything that we've kind of gone over here for Melissa and I both, um, and Jay's going to continue, is about wild ginseng. You know, that's the concern. Those are the things that we're trying to protect. Now, on the flip side, there there is this thing, you know, I guess, artificially propagated ginseng um, is what we call it on our side. Uh, ginseng that's grown under tilled beds, uh, that does happen. We don't have it in Ohio. We do have some folks who you know, call it woods grown uh, ginseng. You know, they go out and they, they do plant seeds in the woods and they they take care of it, cultivate it. So cultivated ginseng is what this is often called. Um, and they you know, maintain those plots and they have traditionally over generations many times, uh, but that's woods grown. When it comes to cultivated ginseng or artificially propagated ginseng, this is the kind of scenario that that, uh, that falls into. And this happens a lot in Wisconsin, some up in Canada. Um, and, and this is where a lot of the ginseng comes from that goes into a lot of those products that Melissa was showing you there a while ago, some of the sodas and teas and, and things like that. But the uh, some of the chemical compounds and some of the important elements within the plant, uh, traditionalists don't think it, it's not the same level in, in cultivated ginseng, so they want the wild ginseng. So wild, wild harvest is probably always going to be with us. Uh, just because of that desire for it on the market. That's all I have, and I'll turn it over to uh, Jay Obley. Hey, Ron, before I let you go, um, I do have a couple questions that came in. Um, yeah. So somebody had asked if there's commercial growers of ginseng in Ohio. So we have one or two people here in the state, uh, the two that I have talked to, uh, that are doing some commercial growing, but they actually grow it in individual pots. So they are planting it in pots, putting it in local shade uh, right next to their house. Um, and we're talking maybe 100, 150 plants, very limited number, and they sell those kind of as an heirloom type of plant um, at different shows and things around. Large scale cultivated ginseng, like, like in the picture, we just showed does not happen in Ohio. We just we don't have it. Our conditions, our soils aren't quite right for it. Uh, that takes place mostly in Wisconsin, Ontario, Canada, um, and to the north of us. Okay, great. And um, one last question uh, before we pass it to Jay. Um, if you, you you talked about legal and illegal harvesting. Now, if you accidentally find ginseng while you're hiking. Is it legal to keep it? So in Ohio, the harvest season is September 1 through December 31. So if you are, A, we don't allow collection on public land. So state parks, wildlife areas, uh, those types of things, natural areas, of course, um, there's no harvest allowed on those public lands. Um, on private property, if you had permission from the landowner, yes, you could harvest it during that time of season. Uh, or that time of year, but you have to have permission to do so from the landowner. Uh, just like hunting, uh, it requires written permission. And we do get a fair number of complaints. So a lot of folks know what they have growing out there. And uh, so they get upset when people are digging without permission. And uh, But out hiking, hey, if you're in a place where you're allowed to harvest, feel free to do so during the season. Um, one thing that I do want to say and I touched on it a minute ago, Jennifer Wintus's work about when the seeds are ripe. We we just had a project, and I don't know if Jay's going to talk about it or not, where we had a lot of people who were harvesting prior to season. Um, when we're taking plants prior to the season, it's very detrimental to the population. We want to make sure that those plants get to mature, drop their seeds to, so that we continue to grow the population before harvest is allowed to take place. And that's why the season date is so important to us. 
OK, great. Um, I'm going to pass it to Jay. We do have a couple other questions that came in, but um, they might be answered during the presentation. And if not, we'll get to those soon. Um, so Jay, uh, take it away. All right. And we can see your presentation now, just went live. I'm having troubles there. Was it up there, Alyssa? I yeah, it, it, no. it was up there. Um, go ahead and okay. try and share that again and um, Sorry okay. about that. That's okay. Well, um, while you're sharing that, uh, I don't know if Jay or excuse me, Melissa or Ron might be able to answer one of the other questions that came in. Um, we we got a question, a couple questions about uh about wildlife that eat the plant or the root so um one question was do critters like to eat the plant or the root and somebody asked specifically about deer do they eat ginseng plants um so it looks like jay's popped up but if we could answer this question and then i'll get back to you jay um go ahead to Lisa, you saw that in the future sure. go ahead Okay, yeah, sure, sure. So deer really do like to eat the leaves of ginseng. Um, I know when I was going out and uh, checking my populations that I had tagged, um, I often was too late. So the deer had already come in and dumped off all of the leaves. It's kind of like a delicacy for them. Turkeys like to eat the seeds. Sometimes you have rodents going in there and um, eating those seeds that fall on the ground. So yes, there is wildlife that eats it. Um, some of our, our thrushes, um, there's actually a, the a wood thrush actually can consume that seed and transport that uh, seed intact. And that's one of the only birds that's ever been known to actually uh, move that plant. Otherwise, the seeds are usually dropping right underneath the plant or maybe rolling down the hill. Um, but there, there's actually some research out there on that. Thanks, Melissa, and I'm sending Jay live. All right, thanks, Alyssa. Appreciate everyone tuning in and just kind of recap about what Ron talked about with enforcement. And if you noticed in his management program, that was the number one bullet was enforcement. And with wildlife officers, they have many responsibilities and ginseng enforcement is one of them. You know, a wildlife officer's day could consist of starting out doing a wildlife survey in the morning and then meeting with the landowner in the afternoon, do crop damage. And then maybe a, later after that, checking fishermen and then on the way through a, a wildlife area or or driving home, they get a call or a complaint from a landowner and end up coming across a ginseng violation. And then wildlife officers, we're not the only ones, like Ron said, that can enforce ginseng laws. Other officers that can enforce ginseng laws are natural resource officers. And which if, if you tuned in uh, to the earlier episodes, uh, I think last uh, Tuesday, Officer Lagore and Officer Keller, they both had their canine dogs and uh, Officer Keller's dog was able to be uh, trained to detect ginseng and find ginseng and also you know we work hand in hand with the natural resource officers and a lot of times we'll work together and make these cases and i think if you noticed on one of ron's last slides there was a natural resource officer there along with the wildlife officer where they had made a, a case and then other officers that work ginseng enforcement that we work closely with are the muskingum watershed officers those officers that patrol your muskingum watershed lakes like Seneca, Piedmont, Tappan, Clendenning. And then also deputy sheriffs, state highway patrol, uh, police officers in your towns. 
sometimes they'll conduct search warrants or make traffic stops and if they're within their jurisdiction they can also enforce our ginseng laws and at times they will contact or reach out to us and we'll, we'll walk them through the steps to uh, prosecute those cases um let's see let's go on to our next slide and then the other aspect of the management program that ron talked about was the training that uh, our agency is responsible for and we do provide ginseng enforcement training not only to our officers but to the those natural resource officers the muskingum watershed officers sheriff deputies police officers and sometimes judges and prosecutors and then we've even went out to uh different groups and, and landowners and and advised them and, and educated them on what they have on their properties and how to uh, protect that that uh, resource that they have on their property let me back up a slide i'm sorry if you if you look uh i don't know if you can see it but uh this is uh officer barry he's in muskingum county and these are cadets that uh that just went through the last class what we do with our, our officers again they're in the classroom um like you see on the left and then once we're done with the classroom work we uh, take them out in the field and let them experience trying to find and locate those uh, ginseng plants and then we show them how to how that ginseng plant is harvested and what's what's required a lot of this information that we do when we train our officers or other agencies is the same information that that ron and and, and melissa talked about earlier uh Alyssa, or i'm sorry melissa has helped out quite a bit over the years in in training our folks and other law enforcement agencies. Uh, this another aspect of, uh, of training our officers and, and is what, what to look for when they're out there on patrol. You know, typically a ginseng digger, they're going to have dirty knees, dirty fingernails. A lot of times they'll wear camouflage so they're not, they're not uh, seen. They try to conceal themselves. Uh, also, we teach them to look for parked cars or parked vehicles and places that uh, kind of out of the ordinary. But sometimes they could uh, also park in places where uh, someone might be fishing or hunting or trapping or, or just hiking. And we teach our officers to kind of key on clues that are in that vehicle or, or associated with that vehicle to maybe give you a better indicator. And then um, you know, a lot of times these these uh, folks that harvest ginseng, they use certain uh, tools to harvest ginseng, which we'll, we'll show and talk about here later. Again, and this going back to the enforcement training, this is a scenario. We, we like to train our officers through a lot of scenario based type training, basically taking what you learn in the classroom and then applying that basically in the field in, in a controlled setting and let them learn from that uh, information they learned in the classroom. What you're seeing here is, is an officer uh, playing a ginseng digger. And as you see, the officer's contacting that person and it looks like he's checking what he has with him. It looks like you can see a, a digging tool and it looks like he has a some sort of bag that he's keeping his ginseng or other roots in and when i was talking about clues or items that uh, they like to use to harvest ginseng this is a sign this is a an actual picture that one of our officers come across uh, this the sign was on a car but the officer picked up on some other clues and suspected this person was a ginseng digger and sat on the vehicle and ended up making the case and as you can see they had a crowbar and a screwdriver those were their main digging tools to harvest these ginseng plants which if you look at these two plants these are immature plants that are illegal to harvest like melissa had talked about earlier legal plants have to have at least three prongs and these as you can see only have appear to only have two 
Again, here's some more, more digging tools that uh, our officers will come across when they're in the field and uh, they, they catch someone digging illegally, whether it's without written permission or where they're not supposed to be. It's com seems like a common tool is, uh, as you can see here, screwdrivers. Here's another picture of a common tool that you'll see these little Maddox folks like to use. And a lot of times, like I said, they either carry a backpack, fanny pack, or sometimes they'll even just use a Walmart bag or a bread sack. And again, a lot of times, like I said earlier, we look for people that have clothing that you know, appears that they've been on their knees on the ground because when you're out digging ginseng or harvesting ginseng or any type of medicinal root that's in the ground, you're on the ground, you're getting dirty and it's usually hot and you're going to start to sweat. And a lot of times you'll you'll see folks, they'll have have this right here, which is, you know, caused from wiping the sweat off their face. And I'm sure if any viewers have been outside and got, got sweaty and they had to wipe their face, sometimes they've used their their T-shirt to do that. But this is what uh, what you're going to see a lot of times in their clothing. The next slide here is uh, is basically what what Melissa talked about. This is kind of early in the season, and we we start patrolling and we start getting complaints typically in August, July, August. But we've made cases in April and May. Uh, we've had complaints May, June, but uh, as time goes on, the plant, as it gets dry or we get frost, it'll start to turn yellow. And by the end of November, typically, these, this is what you see, or if you see this at all, it's just a stem. These leaves will fall off and all you'll have is the stem left. But there are, there are, they, some ginseng harvesters out there that that uh, they can they can locate these ginseng place plants late in the year just by the stem that's how good they are another common thing that uh, these ginseng diggers like to dig while they're out looking for ginseng is what's known as golden seal or yellow root it's another valuable medicinal root this year it averaged in the range of 40 to 50 dollars a pound and what time a lot of times what we'll find is uh folks will, will harvest yellow root and 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 also dig ginseng at the same time there is no season on yellow root but again you cannot dig yellow root on any state public property Some of the places that our officers patrol primarily are public lands for ginseng harvest, because like Ron had mentioned earlier, you can't harvest ginseng on any public property with there's one exception, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, this is a popular place, Blue Rock State Forest Officer Jeff Berry, who's in Muskingum County. He, he makes a lot of cases catching catching bad guys digging ginseng or even girls digging out of season at uh, Blue Rock State Forest and uh, in that area. Another popular place is the uh, Wolf Creek Burr Oak area. And the place I was talking about that uh, does allow ginseng harvesting that is public land that allows us also hunting, fishing, and trapping is the Wayne National Forest. It allows harvesting up to six medicinal plants, but you have to purchase a $20 permit to be able to do that. And then you have to follow their rules that they put in place because they designate certain areas where you can harvest those medicinal plants. Those six plants uh, would be black, or I'm sorry, yeah, black cohosh, blue cohosh, snake root, yellow root, blood root, wild gender. And then also you can also get a ginseng permit, per, permit which is separate from the others that I just mentioned. 
and then that permit will allow you to harvest ginseng on Wayne National Forest property and designated areas, and then you have to report that to Wayne National Forest. That Wayne National Forest has three different offices. There's one in Athens, Marietta, and Ironton. You, you can get this information from their website. It's at uh, www.fs.usda.gov backslash Wayne. But it's a common area also that officers will patrol. And our officers do make a lot of violations or in those areas for harvesting out of season or without a permit or before season. And then we also work closely. The Wayne National Forest does have their own officers and we have trained them as well and worked closely with them in the past. Um, some of the tools that our officers use when, when out there on patrol, you know, of course, binoculars, spotting scope, night vision, and, and our officers, when, they, when they're out on patrol, they're very good and very patient. They like to, uh, you know, if they find something, they'll sit and wait and watch to when it's time to uh, make contact with the person. Another tool that uh, is, is useful, and I think uh, Officer Quinn Levin had talked about this earlier in the month, is our, our aircraft. Uh, we have an aviation section, and our, our main pilot is Joe Barber, and he also helps with uh, our enforcement and patrol. I know we've had projects in the past where we've used aircraft to try to locate ginseng poachers. Another valuable tool that we've just had added, which if you tuned in last Tuesday, we, we had the canine officers on. And uh, what you see here is uh, Officer Gilkey and Mattis. They are in Meigs County. They're in our district. We have a canine in each district, one per district. And what's special about our canines, like Officer LeGore and Officer Keller had mentioned last week, is that they're not trained for drugs or trained for wildlife, picking up wildlife scents, whether it's a, a deer, turkey, or even ginseng. And this picture, if, I don't know if you can see it, but where my uh, laser pointer, can you see my laser pointer, Alyssa? Uh, I saw it earlier. I can't see it right now for some reason. All right, so I'm sorry about that. If you- Oh, there, I see it now, Ralph, see, or Jay. Okay. If you can see Mattis is laying down, which that's an indicator to the handler, Officer Gilkey, that he's found something. And if you can see where my pointer is, I don't know if you can see it, there's a monster can. And uh, what happened with this uh, this case is this is in Muskingum County, and Officer Barry was on patrol that day, uh, received a complaint, actually came from a school bus driver in Muskingum County. Uh, the school bus driver had reported that she had seen two people standing alongside the road dressed in camouflage and she had noticed one of them was holding a monster can. So Officer Barry and, and Officer Gilkey, they did a track, which our dogs are able to track individuals and also do article searches but uh, Mattis was able to locate this can, which Officer Barry was able to trace back uh, to a local store and then figure out who bought the can and then end up making the case, which I thought was uh, very good work on both Officer Gilkey, Officer Mattis, and Officer Barry. Also, nowadays, uh, there's, there's trail cameras in the woods. Anyone's been in the woods frequently, there's trail cameras. It seems like no matter where you go, a lot of those trail cameras are put up by private property landowners for various reasons where it's to catch, um, capture pictures of wildlife or maybe even to catch uh, or capture pictures of people trespassing on their property. Uh, this picture here is, is, a, is a person that uh, was captured on a private property trail camera. Um, 
that uh, we were able to track down and figure out who it was. Uh, you know, a lot of times landowners will call and share information about people digging on their property and stealing their ginseng, and they help our officers catch a lot of these bad guys. And and, and a lot of the times when when these guys are caught, uh, you know, we seize we seize their ginseng. We sometimes seize their digging tools, and then you know they have to appear in court and. The penalty for digging ginseng illegally is a misdemeanor of the first degree, which that's the highest degree of a misdemeanor. And then violators that uh, are are brought into court, they can receive up to a thousand dollar fine and 180 days in jail. Typically, sentences vary in, from court to court, but fines are anywhere from a basically a dollar to five hundred dollars and, and it typically like I said it depends on what the court court typically does there uh, we have some really supportive courts in the state of Ohio and uh, a lot of times uh, people will receive jail times but generally like I said it's usually a dollar to five hundred dollar fine and then uh, court costs are usually a hundred dollars or more and then on top of that like I said, jail time, sometimes probation, uh, suspension of their digging rights to where they're not allowed to harvest any medicinal roots. And then sometimes also they have to do community service. Uh, you know, our, our enforcement efforts from our officers are for those folks out there that are out there digging and harvesting ginseng legally and, and to meet the needs of the management program to conserve the life of the ginseng plant. And Ron mentioned, you know, we've had several cases. Uh, we work ginseng frequently when it comes that time of year. Like I said, we start typically July, August, September. But again, we we have had cases in early as May, sometimes April. But um, we've we've conducted a lot of investigations that lead to search warrants where large amounts of ginseng were was seized. And this is another case. I believe that this was in Muskingum County. Um, here you have Officer Lane, it's in Perry County, Officer Dodge in Hawking County, and then in the back is Todd Stewart, Morgan, and then up front is Jeff Berry in Muskingum. Recently, recently we uh, conducted at least two different investigations that I can think of that basically lasted for like two years. One was back in 2007 and went from 2007 to 2009. And then we did another one in 2000, started in 2018, just a couple of years ago. And then we were just trying to wrap it up now here in 2020. The uh, the project in that I mentioned first in 2007 to 2009, it resulted in 78 violations and $55,000 in restitution. And then uh, we seized over, I think it was 156 pounds of ginseng. Now the, the most recent case that uh, we just wrapped or we're working on wrapping up here that started in 2018 that was a collaborative effort with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we conducted four search warrants here in Ohio but there were also search warrants conducted in four other states uh, that was done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that would have been in uh, Pennsylvania West Virginia, Indiana, and Kentucky. And then when we have these seizures and we do these large cases and we seize a lot of, a lot of ginseng, all our, all our ginseng that we seize uh, goes to a sale, it's auctioned off, and then back, latest numbers I had from back in 2017, uh, that sale generated a little over $83,000 force and and does that money go to the division of wildlife jay yes Alyssa, that's a great question the high revised code in the high revised code it does say that that money and funds generated from that do come back to the division of wildlife for that ginseng program And with that, th here's our contact information. If there's any questions, Alyssa. There are questions, yes. Um, 
Let's see. <clears throat> Sorry. So if someone is caught illegally harvesting ginseng, do they get their hunting license revoked or barred from other uh, wildlife recreational activities? Typically, if it has something to do with ginseng, it only it only applies to that ginseng harvesting. Not it doesn't typically affect their hunting or fishing or trapping. If that's what they're asking. Okay. Yeah, I think that was what they're what they were asking. Um, so, so somebody had a, a great question um, asking that does a legal digger have to carry his permit and landowner's permission with him or her? Yes, it's required if they're digging on harvesting on private property, they need to have their written permission with them. And the other aspect that uh, I, I don't think we mentioned in this presentation, one of the regulations when you're harvesting ginseng during the season is that you have to keep daily records and those records you have to have written down by midnight of that night and you have to record how many pounds, ounces or number of roots and then the county and then the date that those roots were harvested in and you have to keep those records with you. Okay and a couple more questions. Um, why does ginseng that sees, why, why doesn't it get replanted? Is that possible? That's a good question. A lot of times we can't do that because we have to hold on to that ginseng for evidence purposes. So we have our evidence room set up so that we can keep that ginseng and preserve it for evidence value. But then by that time, it's uh, a lot of times it's it's in a dry form and you can't replant a ginseng root that's been dried out. That makes sense. So a lot of times, no, we, we do not replant it. Makes sense. Um, and, and we have a question from Karen. She asked, do illegal harvesters sell through brokers? Are those brokers required to report what they receive? That's a great question as well, Alyssa. Ron touched on it about the certification. A lot of times those certifications are for dealers and those dealers apply for a permit through the Division of Wildlife. And then for that certification process, they have records that they turn in. Well, those dealers, they are buying typically from individuals like you or me if we went out to harvest the ginseng those individuals would take it to a dealer and then they would sell it to that dealer and that dealer has to keep track of that same information on his records and then when they that dealer brings those records and their ginseng to the certification process all that has to match what they have if that makes sense yeah and and one last question then i'm going to pass it to to ron uh, i think he wanted to wrap up a couple of things, but so when these when there's these bad guys that illegally harvest, um, say they're harvesting on private land, how can it affect that grower? You know, does it how much does it cost that person? Actually, I, I that was one of the things I was going to touch on, Alyssa, in my wrap up. Okay. To throw that in there, um, and I'll I'll just do that right now. How's that sound? Does that work for you? Perfect. You're live. So uh, big thing to remember, so we've talked about research. We've talked about the program overall and what our goal is as a state agency. And you've heard from Jay talking about targeting illegal dealers, or I'm sorry, diggers, and sometimes dealers as well, like we just did in our recent case, uh, in, the, in the work that the enforcement guys are doing in the field. And then the role of CITES overall. The big thing to remember is um, we talk about poaching and poaching a lot of times is put with wildlife and, and that, but this really is a theft. So ginseng doesn't have legs. It can't get up. It can't walk over here when it, you know, doesn't like something that's going on. It can't, you know, run away from a threat. It can't do those types of things. It's it's rooted in the ground. It's somebody's private property, um, whether it's on state land, on, you know, DNR lands. 
It's property of the people of the state of Ohio, and the people of the state of Ohio have made the decision that ginseng on public land is not going to be harvested. It's going to be our remnant populations, our, our refuge, so to speak, for the plant. When it comes to private property, remember, it's private property, and there's a theft that takes place when someone poaches or steals ginseng from another person. So looking at it from the face of the wildlife officer, you know, we go from poaching crimes a public resource that we want to make sure is harvested during the right season under the right methods and accounted for properly to now a theft offense is often what happens here with ginseng. So monetarily, ginseng is worth a lot of money. Um, depending on the year, you go back uh, 10, 12 years ago, ginseng was $1,000 a pound. Pretty much anything you brought to them was $1,000 a pound. There's lots of different grades and variants, even from one part of the state to another. What what a dealer will pay you. But in general, even this year was, I'm gonna say six to 700 pounds and, and I could be off a little bit, but in general, that's still a lot of money. That's for a pound of dried ginseng. Uh, here in Ohio, about 310, 315, I think it might be a little higher than that actually, 330 plants per pound. So, you know, when, a lot of plants, but also there's a, a lot of value there. Our ginseng goes into international market. Very little ginseng collected here in Ohio, uh, you know, goes into town and gets put into a product with a local processor or anything like that, or used by individuals. Our ginseng ends up in Korea and ends up in Hong Kong. Those are our two biggest markets, and our two larger dealers. That's where they're exporting to. Um, so there is an international flavor to this, and there's. Because of the money involved, there's reason to cheat and reason for people to trespass and steal. But uh, when it comes to landowners, we have landowners who know what they got, um, that have been taking care of it, cult you know, cultivating it, uh, caring for it themselves. Um, we have um, all kinds of, of folks out there. So some folks are doing this intentionally and they know when they get hit, when they get, you know, this is our family college fund. I've, I've heard that story a number of times now in my tenure as the ginseng coordinator. You know, we've been taking care of this ginseng for 20 years and this was all for our children's college fund. And they hit us last night and they took, or this week, and they got a thousand plants off of us or something like that. And, and it's just uh, heartbreaking for a lot of these folks when they get hit. And it's a financial hit for the ones that know what they're doing and have been taking care of these plants. And um, but I did. I just wanted to, I guess, wrap it up with that. There is an international market. It has a lot of value. It's not necessarily poaching. It's theft, and and we are targeting a legal harvest. So go ahead, Alyssa. And and when these folks get hit, this isn't something that they can just plant again that season, and next year it pops up and they can harvest it. Right? It takes a long right. time. Long yes. Time. So remember, three prong plant takes seven to ten years to become a three prong plant just to reach sexual maturity where it can be harvested. So this is, um, and just because it's a, a three-pronged plant doesn't mean that's where you wanted to harvest it. You may want it to age a little bit more and be a larger root. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have another question that came in and we're, we're a little over time. So thanks for those of you that joined us. So I'll ask this question and then we're gonna wrap it up. But what's the best way to get educated on the proper procedure for someone who wants to learn to dig properly? You know, our website, we have our, our green gold brochure, which I can't remember what that number is. Number seven, I think, um, publication seven. But uh, don't be afraid to call your, your wildlife officer. Every county has a wildlife officer. Don't be afraid to call the wildlife officer. Information on the website. Cool. That would be a good place to go. Well, thank you to our presenters. Thanks for those of you that, that watched. Um, speaking of wildlife officers in uh, all your different counties, um, we will have three of them with us next week for our webinar. So next uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m., Tuesday the 24th, we will be talking about common questions, frequently asked questions and calls that wildlife officers get. And we'll have officers from Northwest Ohio, uh, Northeast and Southeast Ohio, so they can cover a range of topics um, so hopefully you can join us then and um, thanks for joining today. Have a good one.